Two big categories. First, the big cases the court has already heard. They voted on them privately, but the court has not yet publicly announced or published an opinion. Those cases include affirmative action, voting rights, and forced union dues. So if, for example, there are cases that were 9-0 in these private votes, well, the court could just finish those up, write the opinions, issue those as an 8 to nothing ruling. It is the cases where Scalia's vote made the difference that will be very tricky. Does the court decide to rehear them, as we discussed? When the uh, once the bench is fully staffed again, or issue them as tied decisions. Now the case is yet to be heard. That'll be in the next month or so. To include a big abortion case, a challenge by religious groups to the HHS contraceptive mandate from the health care law, and a multi-state challenge to the president's use of executive power on immigration. We do expect the court is going to hear those as scheduled in March and April. But if they wind up in a 4-4 tie, we go back to those considerations about whether to hold them over or simply issue them as a tie and let the, uh, the lower court ruling stay in place. Chef? Shannon, thanks so much. Terrific coverage over the weekend. Thank you. Let's bring in Robert Barnes now. He covers the Supreme Court for the Washington Post newspaper and is live with us from our Washington newsroom. Sir, thank you so much. Glad to be here. I, I want to quote from the Constitution real quickly, something that Antonin Scalia often did, uh, and I think we have a full screen of this for you. The president shall not nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. Why? And then it will be up to the Senate to act or not. Uh, this is an unusual situation because it's an election year and as you say, as we've said in the previous parts of this, there's a lot of animosity between the president and the Republican senators. There is and you could argue all day about how it began. Uh, both sides, each side has its own argument about, about the, the you know, the roots of that. But the Constitution doesn't say anything about election year. The Constitution says that the president shall nominate and by and with advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. Why should he not do that? Uh, I don't think that uh, he would think that he shouldn't. He thinks he should. The uh, Republican senators seem to think that any uh, nominee he sends will be dead on arrival and thus that he should just wait. But I think that's very unlikely that the president's going to accommodate them that way. I, I wonder, like, for instance, and we've all heard talk of this particular one, Sri Srinivasan, who was appointed to the D.C. Circuit Court, uh, what, like three years ago. Uh, every single member of the Senate voted yes. I believe it was 97 to nothing. Every single re Republican said yes, we approve of him. Would the Republicans need to come up with something that they no longer like about him? Or could they just say, this is politics and this is what we're going to do, and that Antonin Scalia liked the Constitution, we don't, we're, we're, we're not going to let this happen. Is there something so, else they could just say? Well, so far what they've said is that we're just not going to do it, that it should be left over, that it's too late in the process. You know, it's very unusual to have an opening in an election year. It hasn't happened that often. The last time uh, that a justice was confirmed in an election year was Justice Kennedy. He was confirmed by a Democratic Senate unanimously, but as Republicans will point out, that's to fill a vacancy that happened in the year before. And so we're in an unusual situation here. Is there some precedent for not appointing a justice to the Supreme Court because it's an election year? There is not, not that I know of, no.